turn in your scriptures tonight to Proverbs chapter 31 as our opening text, Proverbs chapter 31 this evening. That will not be the main text, but it, it will at least open the door for this message tonight on the topic that you see on the screen, socialism, capitalism, and the Bible, that is a biblical worldview of government and economics. Proverbs 31, of all the texts, of all the passages of Scripture to read, we read the one that concerning the virtuous woman. But at the same time, she was a businesswoman. And so we want to be able to pick up and look at that from the, from the viewpoint of the fact that here was a practice of buying, selling, and trade, manufacturing in the market, and it gives us an idea of the, the Bible's view on uh, economics. And so, um, let's see, where did I find out where I wanted to start on this reading? I don't know that I wrote it down. But uh, let's begin our reading tonight at verse 12. It is verse 12. She will do uh, him good and not evil all the days of her life that is her husband. She seeks wool and flax, works willingly with her hands. She is like the merchant ships. She brings her food from afar. She rises while it is yet night and gives meat to her household and portion to her maidens. She considers a field, buys it. With the fruit of her hands, she plants a vineyard. She girds her loins with strength and strengthens her arms, perceives that her merchandise is good. Her candle goes out not by night. She lays her hand to the spindle and her hands hold fast the distaff. Father, we thank you tonight that as we look at the, the form of economics that we have in the United States, thanking you, Lord, that we, we see the profit behind it. It's, it's helpful for the church. It's helpful for all of society. But we want to understand why and if your word does endorse capitalism. So teach us through the word to have a biblical worldview on this subject, to see it and perceive it and understand it through the lens of Scripture. And we pray and ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. So just in this very short passage of Scripture that we read, and you kind of go down through it, you find that we have somebody who's industrious. She's working with her own hands. She works for a prophet. And while she works there for a prophet, uh, she also uh, is able to feed and maintain her household. In verse 15, she takes into consideration the purchase of property. In verse 16, and she buys it with the fruit of her hands. And what does she do then? She turns that around for additional profit, additional uh, produce. She plants the vineyard. And in verse 17, she girds her loin with strength and, uh, and strengthens her arms. She perceives that her merchandise is good. In other words, it's, she has made something, she has created something that is good, and therefore it's going to be for sale. And this is the whole idea of economics. We look, we're not going to spend our entire evening on that passage, but rather we're, we're going to uh, begin the subject by taking, bringing into consideration the, the idea of socialism, capitalism, and, uh, and what does the Bible have to, to say about it. And so to begin with, we would take first and acquire the things that we want to uh, come into this with a, uh, how do we know that we have a biblical model? But before we can do that, we have to at least acquire a clear and complete picture of a Christian worldview. That is, we must know, in regards to what the subject is, we have to know what the, our basic views are about God, about uh, humankind, morality, and society. So what do the scriptures have to say? That's a question that in any worldview, these things have to come first, especially for the believer. That helps us to interpret and understand all the other philosophies and forms of government and uh, anything from ethics to uh, medicine uh, to law and uh, society. These are all part of the, the, the being able to see these things. We have to have this three-step process. One is to know and acquire a complete picture of a Christian worldview. Secondly is to be able to work and, and to discover the truth. Now, on the subject of economics, that is what about each economic and political system. 
So when we talk about that, is that print large enough? I wasn't so sure if it was going to work. It's too late now. But when we talk about uh, the, the, our system of economics, then you have listed up there, you have capitalism, you have socialism, and then one you may not be familiar with, but yet we live in it, is statism or interventionism. So we, we look at these, and then the point of this is for us to be able to understand each one of these, at least have a knowledge of how they work. And we ask questions. How does it work, and what are the strengths and the weaknesses of each one? So there may be some merit uh, behind a statism, that is, the government intervenes. There may be some uh, merit in a form of socialism, maybe not. But we just, we just can't blindly enter into this and say, well, that's what we've been doing. We have to ask, is it the best thing? Does it agree with the morality of the Bible? Does it have the complement, the endorsement of the Scripture? If not, we can understand one thing. Eventually, it's going to be doomed for failure, or it will not uh, allow us to have the kind of citizenship and economy and government that God well intended for his people. So when we look at this three-step process, we acquire our own understanding of God, humanity, society, morality, sin, eternity, and authority, the whole other things other than what is listed here. And then secondly, we talk, and when we think about economics, we have to also take consideration of what, what form works. We take, and we would also then compare each one of these to the standard of the Bible. Now, I'll mention verses to these later at the end of the slide, but for the purpose of what you see on the screen, we compare to the standard of the, of the Bible's morality, and is it consistent with a biblical worldview? For example, what about wages? The, 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 the wage system that uh, capitalism has compared to that of socialism is that uh, the, the scriptures speak about the subject of wages, and if it does, how does it address who gets paid and how much? How about generosity? How about giving to the poor? What about employment? Uh, and what about employers? And then the subject of taxes and the subject of laziness. Those are all things that we're used to, and uh, we, we live with them all the time. That is our economy. And so when we make a comparison of different forms of economics, we bring those systems into the, up against the Scriptures, and these are the categories, these are the elements of a, of a, of this, of a system that the Bible will make, give us clarity on it. So at each one of those, we, the Bible has something to say on the subject. So moving along, because I don't want to spend a lot of this, it's just quite self-explanatory. We'll save some of the detail for later on here this evening. So what are the four aspects of a biblical worldview. So we said if we're going to uh, be able to interpret capitalism, socialism, or statism, then we start with, with any one of these. We have to have a biblical worldview, and there are four aspects that we learn, and then we bring those things to the table of capitalism, socialism, and statism. And so these four aspects, God is a creator, and uh, when, we, when we talk about that, the, a biblical worldview, the fact that God is creator has implications. And you can see that on the screen, the fact that he is the creator of all that exists. He is the rightful owner of all that exists. And then what does that make us? If God is the owner, but yet we've been given the responsibility to maintain the earth. We've been given the, the responsibility of dominance over his creation. That makes us stewards of God's real estate, stewards of God's money, stewards of the gifts that he's given to us, the, the forms of government. We are simply his managers of all of these things that he owns. In 1 Chronicles chapter 29, verses 11 to 12, uh, the, the Solomon says this, Yours, O Lord, is the greatness, the power, and the glory, the victory, and the majesty, for all that is in heaven and in earth is yours. Yours is the kingdom, O Lord, and you are exalted as head over all. Both riches and honor come from you, and you reign over all. In your hand is power and might, and it is in your hand it is to make great and to give strength to all. 
So the, one of the first things, the four aspects of a biblical worldview, God as creator, what are the implications behind that? The, is the fact that he has created everything, he is the, ultimately the rightful owner. And therefore, we have the responsibility of stewardship, and it's a temporary stewardship. Now, why is that important? Because when we stand that beside socialism, we begin to find out that ownership then falls entirely upon a group of planners, and as if it was ours by right, and it's theirs by right, and other people have nothing to say about it. But when we talk about a biblical view, God is the creator, we are simply his servants. Secondly is the word freedom. Freedom is a gift from God, not a gift from government. And so that doesn't take much to figure it out, but yet uh, some forms of government, some forms of economy have the idea that if there's going to be freedom, it's because we gave it to you. Even the founding fathers uh, understood that there are rights, inalienable rights, that are things that were just made common sense, uh, that, that originated from God. In Ecclesiastes chapter 5, verses 18 to 20, again, another text of Scripture that addresses this subject as who gives the gifts, who gives employment, who gives the ability to work. Well, when you read the book of Ecclesiastes, you would find very quickly that there are so many things that we take for granted, and, uh, such as work, jobs, wages, and uh, society, that these are things that are gifts from God. Here's what I've seen. It is good and fitting for one to eat and drink and to enjoy the good of what? All his labor, in which he toils under the sun all the days of his life, which God gives him, for it is his heritage. God gives man labor, God gives man toil. God gives man the gift to enjoy his labor. As the creator, as the giver, the rightful owner, he gifts it to people. Mankind, God gives him, it is his heritage. As for every man to whom God has given riches and wealth and give him power to eat of it, to receive his, inher his heritage, and rejoice in his labor. This is the gift of God. For he will not dwell on duly in the days of his life because God keeps him busy with the joy of his heart. Now one of the clear things that come out of that passage is the fact that as God gives to us uh, the, the gift of work and the ability to do that, it is, it is, a, it is from God and not the government. It is not from any economic system, but rather God says, here's labor, enjoy it. And it's a, a heritage that is yours to enjoy the whole time. And then we go to the third, the third one on there, and that is morality. When we talk about morality, it's a, a, the biblical ethics of economy and society. They're very important. They're very key elements to a biblical worldview. So if we're going to examine capitalism and socialism, and this is probably the area that uh, has, makes the most sense, the, a profound impact upon definition of uh, whether socialism is a working uh, co view uh, or whether capitalism. For example, we, we talk about that, you, you have to bear in mind that um, the biblical ethics of economy. If you were to go to Leviticus chapter 25, which we're not going to do right now, but in Leviticus chapter 25, we find that there were laws written. And, we, and when you look at them at first, it's just blah, 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 blah. But yet, every one of the laws come out in several different categories in this one chapter. There are laws regarding property sales. The price, that was, uh, the price that was paid, and when that same property can be purchased back, the 50 years, the year of Jubilee. There were laws regarding the buyback of homes. There are laws regarding interest on loans on property. There are laws that were written in that chapter 25 that define the terms in years of how long property can be held. There are laws, regulations regarding harvest, 
And then there is home sales and remortgage and being able to buy your home back, probably because you mortgaged it out with a second mortgage in order to gain some money. And, and uh, the way that Leviticus is written, there are term limits to that. You can only extend it so far. And then, most importantly, there are lending laws to the poor. Now, you, you take the time to read that and put it into the context of the morality of a biblical worldview and then any system of economics, does it stand rightfully in, within the morality, the biblical ethics of the scriptures? And then the last one is the, the subject of sin. So any system of economy that we have must take into consideration the fact that there is sin and human depravity that will indeed affect economics. You see, socialism uh, waits for and hopes for to eventually work toward Marxism, and then Marxism, when it, it under its idea and its disguise, is going to lead us to that perfect society called a utopia. Well, what the socialism and Marxism fail to recognize when we as believers look at this system in a biblical worldview, they fail to recognize that there will always be greed and hatred. There will always be dissatisfaction, discontentment. There will never be a satisfaction of, of all the wealth that anybody gets. Somebody's going to be poor. And so therefore, because of the, the, the sin nature of humanity, uh, socialism, Marxism, and the utopia will never actually find fulfillment. A biblical worldview on systems of economy require us to look at these four areas. God is the creator. What does he have to say about his creation and, and the responsibility of his, cre of his created people? The freedom, how much freedom do we have within a society in business? Thirdly, is that of morality? Does the system itself recognize and, and live under the guidance of the morality of the scriptures and the, and the laws regarding wages and, and uh, laziness and penalties and so buying and sell of property, trade? Does the system recognize what the scriptures have to say about the fact that sin exists in the world and it will in some way shape or form it is going to impact any kind of uh, economics whether it be capitalism or socialism or even statism for that matter we go to the next slide and we find this the major e three major economic systems the first one that uh, the one that we're most familiar with is that of capitalism but I want you to see, if you can read it up there, is capitalism pretty much defines what is known as economic freedom. It's one of the dominant features of capitalism, and it's the right of people to exchange things voluntarily free of choice. So our text that we read, Proverbs chapter 31, in verses, especially in verses 15 to 18, here we find this virtuous woman in the, in the business of buying and selling and trading. She uh, manufactures things and takes it to the market to buy and sell. It's a voluntary system. She was not coerced to do that. She didn't do it because it was part of a market system that, that stressed manufacturing at the cost of labor so that a special interest group, the elite uh, planners, would be able to reap all the profits and, and meet their own ends for their own purposes. So capitalism, it's, it basically, it's, it's a, just a free exchange system. Now, one of the, 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 there are downsides to these things, but yet capitalism has a way of writing itself. So remember, morality and sin also have to be uh, brought into the picture. We have to look at capitalism through morality, and then what about what is the issue of sin? Well, even in capitalism, there will be immoral actions. There will be times when uh, deceitfulness and corruption enter into business and into the uh, economy itself. And that is because of sinful humanity. Man, greed is just as active in capitalism as it is in socialism. But the difference between the two is in a capitalistic free market society, we have the potential of being able to fix the problem. Because in the end, the business will fail or the businessmen will go to jail, but there will something because of the morality of the scripture that addresses the problem of theft and fraud and overcharging interest rates, etc. 
after a given period of time, it will begin to right itself and go toward a center. Socialism does not do that. It does not have that kind of liberty. You speak about socialism, and what socialism does, it replaces the, the freedom of market. It replaces the free market system with central planners. And these central planners, they are the ones that have control over essential market systems. And so the, the planners look out and they're, they pretend to be uh, the kind of looking in an economic glass ball and being able to predict uh, what the future holds for the market, for the United States, for the finances, etc. These social planners and financial planners, uh, they, they do not recognize God as creator, nor do they recognize morality, nor do they recognize the, the factor of sin, or any of the three, four things that we talked about earlier, but rather they're only interested in one thing, that there's a loss of freedom, the laborer cannot have his freedom, and it's not for the interest of the laborer themselves, but rather in their own particular interest. So it replaces uh, the freedom over in the market with the planners, or what we're really saying, it replaces with government, and then that has control over essential market function, whether it's going to pass or fail. Now, we also have to remember that even in, in socialism, it sits on a sliding scale, just like interventionism sits on a sliding scale, and even capitalism. By that, let me give you a, an illustration of what we, we mean by that statement, and that is this. You can see by that chart at the bottom, you have the three main categories, socialism, interventionism, and then capitalism. We're going to call this the continuum of economic systems. And the, the truth of the matter is that there are degrees of each one of these, degrees in socialism as there are degrees in capitalism. It depends on which direction they are moving. So if we take uh, uh, socialism as an example, there is a, a basic distrust of contempt for market process. And, uh, but at the same time, it needs capitalism in order to function. In order to be able to uh, operate and get started, it needs a buying and selling of free market so that the free market then can be brought under a, a socialist uh, government control. But even as socialism works and moves its way towards center, it gets into the area of interventionism. And that is to say that it, uh, it uh, works in such a way that the government begins to intervene. As interventionism moves toward capitalism, it also gives up some of its rights and privileges. And so with that, there is the more freedom a socialist allows, the closer his position is going to be in that of interventionism. And let me explain what I mean by that. We, um, major corporations that have just about gone upside down and have filed for government bankruptcy. And so we think of uh, the Chrysler Corporation, you can think of airlines, you can think of transportation and the railroads, uh, other large businesses that just GM that just cannot function. And so uh, the, the way interventionism works, those things are going to wreak havoc on the national economy. And so interventionism says, we're going to step in, we're going to try and fix this problem. Well, that sounds good for all the employees, maybe, of that large business. But in the end, it's surrendering the free market trade asset. It's surrendering the ability to do things, to be able to trade for something that I prefer to have in exchange for something that it means less to me and becomes more of a fixed system that is established by the planners because they want to try and repair uh, the, the, the brokenness of that particular business or trade, whatever it is. And not only that, even if it's not broke, the government tries to fix it. So one of the classic examples that I think that we all, all know too well is that of healthcare. 
It was a, just a, a, a glaring violation of the free market system when uh, the government decides how much insurance companies can spend and who gets insurance and everything is so clearly outlined in what is phenomenally known as Obamacare. And that is the, probably the most evident case of what we would describe as statism, that is government intervention in a free market society that determines the parameters of what a business or a trade is going to do. And so when we take that in consideration, you find that interventionism, after a while, if it doesn't work right, it's going to slide to the right and move towards capitalism in order to uh, have itself repaired. And uh, with that, then, the closer that more freedom that an interventionist allows, the closer it gets to that of uh, capitalism. So what is capitalism? We said earlier that it was a, a case where you have a, the uh, free market exchange. Uh, on back to this particular slide, the crux to the extent of which human beings will be permitted to exercise their choice in the economic sphere of life. So how much, how much freedom do we have to be able to exercise our freedom in economy? That's the, 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 the crux of the whole matter when you work on this continuum from socialism to interventionism toward capitalism. Somewhere in there, what really matters is how much freedom do we have to exercise our choice choice of products, the choice of how we want to produce something, the choice of newer inventions that are of private enterprise. And so all of this is affected by these three major uh, forms of economic system. Socialism and capitalism, is it between the two, we have to ask the question, is it a peaceful or a violent exchange? Peaceful or violent exchange? Well, how does that work? Let me give you an example. We peaceful exchange means if uh, you do something good for me, then I'll do something good for you. Well, that doesn't mean you scratch my back, I scratch your back. What that means is if you produce something that I like and I can use it, then I can also take advantage of that and I can produce something for you. But we're going to do it on a voluntary basis. We're going to do it in such a way that it's going to be of a peaceful exchange. And so therefore, the United States is well known for its system of having inventions and copyright laws and patents because the men come up with better ideas, the proverbial, the better way to build a mouse trap. And in so doing, uh, he finds a need out in the marketplace. We need better mouse traps because the mice are getting smarter. And so just putting the little pedal with the trip lever and the spring and the hammer coming down, there are some smart mice out there that know how to defeat that. And so we're going to create a better, we're going to put a laser light on the mouse trap. He can't see the laser light. And so when the mouse gets close within the perimeters of the block of wood, boom, there, it's, it's all set and triggered and ready to go. He doesn't even have to touch the pedal. He just crosses the invisible line. Now we know that that doesn't happen, but the point is, Capitalism allows for that. It allows for the uh, peaceful means of exchange. So we may trade mouse traps with another business uh, that sells the springs. We may trade uh, leftover material from our building our mouse traps to a company that can use that. Do you ever wonder whatever happens to sawdust in sawmills? Most of your furniture, these pews are made out of sawdust. But because it was something that didn't mean too much to the guy that's cutting up timber up in, uh, in uh, Oregon, somebody else figured out a way to take sawdust, add some glue to it, and create wood. And because of that free freedom to exchange and uh, doing one thing for that benefited another, capitalism, when it's understood correctly then, uh, epitomizes the voluntary system as a means of exchange. On the other hand, socialism looks at it this way. Unless you do something good for me, I'll do something bad to you. That is the controlling principle of socialism. 
It's a more centralized control. And when you have centralized control, you lack the freedom and the ability to be creative, to buy, sell, and trade, and raise the threshold of the market floor. It's uh, actually, it's more than a centralized control. It entails the, the introduction of coercion in economic exchange to satisfy the goals of the planners. Now, you're, again, we can, we can look at the health care system. When Obamacare first came out, um, everybody had to, to, you had to go choose a plan. You had to choose a program. Well, let's suppose uh, you don't have the money to buy a health care package. Let's suppose you're also in good health. So the first part of our definition, unless you do something good for me, I'll do something bad for you. And that is, we're going to have a controlling factor here. Hmm, I'm doing okay, the health is good, we, we're just in such an income bracket that we can't afford to buy off of anybody right now, that's all fine and well. Now, free market would say that's fine. You take that risk. And if you can negotiate prices with your doctor, then that, that's part of a voluntary system of trade. But in the a socialistic form or interventionism, which is probably where we are at right now, if you don't buy the health care package, you're going to pay a penalty. There will be a fine. So there is the coercion. You have to pay or you're going to pay the price and actually get a zero benefit out of it. And that's where socialism takes us. How does that fit into the morality of the scriptures? It doesn't at all. First off, it's built on the, on the uh, whole concept of greed, that in the end, you follow the money tree, it goes up the, the pyramid, and there's somebody at the top that is becoming very wealthy. It limits the amount of buying, selling, and trading that can take place that is actually there for us in Proverbs chapter 31. So the, um, the reason that, that people exchange things in a market because we think and we believe truly that the, the market is and the trade is good for us. And that makes it then voluntary. If it's not good for me, I don't necessarily have to buy it. And so the, when we consider peaceful or violent exchange, now by violent we don't mean that they're, uh, they're going to come up and march you up and put handcuffs in because you didn't buy this or buy that or, or enter into the program. It's, it's the, the idea of violence here is coercion. You're forced into it. We've all been sitting at the table at some point in time and uh, you're looking at the details of a package and all of a sudden you realize oh, there's no way out of this. In other words, if I don't do this, I have to do this or I got to pay this fine because the answer is yes. And that creates a lot of frustration. And so again, it, it fails to meet the qualifications of a, of a biblical worldview on the subject. Well, some biblical ethics on uh, capitalism and uh, just a couple things to, uh, to mention on this. And that would be that uh, capitalism recognizes that uh, we have inherent human rights. We have the right to make decisions, to uh, be free, to hold property in the light in exchange for something that we own. I'm going to buzz through that real quick and take you to the, the final slide and free market and biblical principles. Does the Bible have anything to say uh, about market, buy, sell, trade, etc., labor, employees? Because that's what capitalism does. It gives the employer the liberty to set wages, to set prices. He can choose who he wants to hire based on the merits of the individual's ability to work and to do that trade. And the Bible speaks of every one of those cap, uh, categories. For example, industrious labor, Proverbs chapter 6 and verse 6, refers us, uh, don't be a lazy man, but look at the ant, see what that ant does, a very industrious individual. And then we have the Bible teaches on giving to the poor. Uh, as a matter of fact, in Ephesians 4.28, has something to do there with law and punishment. That with a thief is, uh, is caught in the act of stealing, uh, one of the things is that man has to have a complete change of heart. But he's got to learn the ethics of labor. Why do we labor? And so let him that stole steal no more. Stop stealing that he may labor to, and earn to give to those that are without. 
in a free market society in capitalism, we recognize there's virtue and value in being able to earn wages and with the excess of wages, we also can help sustain the poor. Those are without, those are in uh, that uh, just, some have, will always have a very difficult time in life. That's just part of God's providence. But capitalism takes that into consideration. And so labor is not meant strictly for ourselves, because later on we'll find, in fact, in the next one, the Bible teaches generosity, not greed. And so Paul warns the rich not to be rich for the purpose of themselves. And in James, he scolds the rich because they hoard money while the poor are out there crying. Also, James speaks to those employers who withhold wages. They withhold wages to the extent that God hears the cry of the laborer in the field. The Bible teaches about contentment and not covetousness in Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 5. Be content with such things you have. Paul writes in Philippians, In whatever state I am in, I have learned to be content. Whether I have a lot or I have a little, I learn to be right in each one of those categories. The Bible teaches for the Christian to seek ye first the kingdom of God, Matthew 6.31, and not a utopia. In other words, our primary goal in life and all the labor that we do and we earn money and we have wages is not so that in the end we are the one with the most toys, we are winners when we die, or that we have the biggest castle, the largest real estate, or even as a population, even as the United States, there's, it was never the goal of the founding fathers or the businessman to make everything a perfect world. It's always going to be competition, it'll be competitive, and it'll always be that where there are going to be those that have greed. But in the end, it's, we'll, we'll find that following these, the Bible speaks of these uh, principles that are part of morality and ethics in the business world. The Bible speaks about uh, laziness. It's, it teaches on the subject of employers. It condemns fraud. It condemns withholding wages. As a matter of fact, in the Leviticus passage, it was, uh, it was a sin. It was a violation of the law of God. If a poor individual needed money and you lent that individual the money, you dare not do it with interest. It had to be f interest-free and, and giving him ample time, even if it was his house, one year up to five years he had time, that individual will have the opportunity to buy his house back. And, and, and the owner, the new owner, had to sell it back to him uh, with the difference between the prices of what uh, he paid and, and, what, and the exchange rate, etc. And then we finally get to the, it gives instructions of what the poor are to do and, and how they manage life. And the, teach, and the Bible also teaches us about on the subject of taxation. So all these things are in the Bible when it comes to uh, the, the capitalism, free market exchange system that, that we have today. So does, are there weaknesses and there, are there faults in capitalism? By all means, there are. And it, it just means this, that we don't call in the finance police to try and fix a problem right away. One of the, the uh, qualities one of the merits of capitalism it would be something like this. So let's go back to the mouse traps, And um, I'm going to start building mouse traps because I want to make a larger profit margin. And one of the first ways that most manufacturings will do, they will begin to use inferior uh, pro properties, inferior materials to build the mouse traps. And so that inferior material might be as such that the, the spring is not as strong, uh, that the trip hammer that comes down to, doesn't have the power to kill the mouse. As a matter of fact, some can crawl out from underneath it. Uh, we literally have video of a rat that, that uh, was able to come out from underneath just as a hammer was coming down on his head. We saw it in slow motion video. We had a rat in a camper at night, so Dexter sets up on super slow motion night vision camera. Eight hours but we fast forward it till we got to that point where the rat is coming up and sniffing the pedal, trips the hammer, but at the same time, the rat was able to jump back and the hammer just missed his head. 
So maybe that was an inferior product. Maybe uh, the guy manufactured the, the rat traps, it was a nice big one, used uh, cheap spring, cheap hardware, and the rat escaped. Well, you know, enough people buy those, and the word gets around, those rat traps, they don't trap nothing. So we're going to go find something. So all the profit margin suddenly begins to disappear. Well, he, he might be uh, cheating the public and selling something that is not really what it is. And we might say, that guy is fraudulent because he's telling me it's going to do this, and it doesn't. That is, that is called, um, you know, poor advertising and misinformation, etc. Well, leave it go for a while because eventually he's not going to have the trade. And so people that exercise greed and fraud in business, when eventually they're found out, the free market society says this, we don't need your business anymore. Socialism, on the other hand, doesn't care whether or not the product is good, whether it's inferior, or the material that is being used. The central planners are only interested in profit at, at any cost and the central planners are going to be the government. And so in the end, you take it or leave it. The morality of the Bible talks about doing things right, doing it right the first time. Industry, thinking, planning, and engineering, all of that we can find throughout the pages of Scripture. That's just a brief excursion on the subject. And so now when you think about why we have capitalism, why did the founding fathers choose that form of economics? because a biblical worldview qualified capitalism to be a good system, not a perfect system, but it was the best system that, that would fall under the purview of, a, of the scriptures when it came to God as creator, when it came to the subject of sin and morality and freedom, that, uh, that our system that we have answers rightly to those four categories from the, world, from the view of the Bible. So Father, help us tonight, now as we enter into the Lord's table, we do so because of a freedom that was purchased for us, not a freedom from slavery of men and governments, but a freedom from sin. And you've given to us, Lord, as uh, your creation, uh, the, the, the liberty to choose to righteousness, to be able to choose Jesus Christ. We thank you, Father, that it was not by coercion, and that even as we do this this evening, we are recognizing and remembering the great work of redemption that you did so that a sinful humanity would be converted and changed to be salt and light on, a, on, on an earth that is corrupt. And so, Lord, this evening, we remember that time, the love of, from you through your Son, as uh, he provided us the way of escape. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.